Uh, welcome, everybody. We're going to get started now. Thank you for joining us for our 2019 Canal Brown Bag Talks. We have two great speakers today um, that are from our 2019 Sea Grant Canal uh, Fellowship Program. And our first speaker is Kelly Ulig. She is passionate about plastics. After earning a Bachelor's of Science in Chemistry at the University of North Florida, she turned her attention toward the issue of microplastic debris. Her master work at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science focused on investigating early estuarine biofilms present on microplastic particles in the partitioning of organic pollutants to bio-based and petrochemical microplastics. <laughs> Kelly is now working in the Ocean Observation and Monitoring Division, the Arctic Research Program and Tropical Pacific Observing System Project. Today she's going to present her research on bio-based bio plastics. Please welcome Kelly. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, thank you, Casey, for that great introduction. Like she said, I'm Kelly Ulig and I work in the Ocean Observation and Monitoring Division office working on the Arctic Research Program. And then in my spare time, I also do the TPOS 2020 project. Um, so I have one. Whoop. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I have one word for you guys, plastics. And Mr. McGuire mm -hmm. wasn't wrong. Plastic production has increased over 620% since um, the year 1975 when the graduate came out. Um, so this is some work from Jambeck et al. Um, back in 2015 that showed that up to 13 million metric tons of, micro of plastics were available to enter the marine environment. Sorry, just gonna move that. Um, so this is primarily due to poor waste management, um, storm runoff carrying roadside debris down into storm drains and into rivers, uh, litter on beaches and coasts, and then the intentional dumping and accidental loss at sea of plastic debris. So what happens to plastics when they end up in the ocean? Um, large pieces of plastics end up getting, sorry, I'll try to reach the side so you guys can see. Um, large pieces of plastic end up being <laughs> degraded by wave action and UV radiation from the sun, forming what we call microplastics, which are less than five millimeters in size. Um, they can be distributed throughout the world due to surface currents, often congregating in areas known as the five gyres. Um, so the five oceanic gyres in each of the major ocean basins. Um, they can also be colonized by microbial communities, causing them to change their buoyancy um, and their density, and they can be mixed through vertical mixing um, throughout the entire water column. Uh, some people suspect that plastic's ultimate reservoir is in the seafloor, uh, where they can be buried in the sediment. So my talk is going to be focusing on these microplastics, pieces of plastics that are less than five millimeters in size. So when thinking about what the scientific community knows about microplastic debris, um, there are a few things that come to mind. We know that microplastics act like a chemical sponge, absorbing uh, contaminants from the, from the environment, including things like PCBs, PAHs, and pesticides. We also know that they leach chemical contaminants um, from the interior of the plastics, things like flame retardants, phthalates, and these sort of proprietary chemicals that we don't really know about. <laughs> Additionally, we know that microplastics can be eaten by small organisms like zooplankton, um, and that filter, feed filter feeders such as oysters can ingest microplastics. What we don't know is if there's any consequence of this, if there is the ability for microplastics and the associated chemicals to, to bioaccumulate and biomagnify up the food chain. We also don't know if there is a human impact from all of this. Um, furthermore, we don't know a lot about the microbial communities that colonize microplastic debris once they end up in the ocean. Um, or how those my microbes affect the fate and distribution of these microplastics. So um, like Casey said, one half of my thesis work, which ended up being kind of a large project, um, focused on the on investigating these microbial communities. Um, so I'm gonna be talking primarily about bio-based plastics today. Bio-based plastics are 
polymers that are created from renewable resources um, so they are not dependent on a petroleum feedstock. Um, in some cases, they are biodegradable, but this is not true for all bio-based plastics. Either way, they can be considered a green alternative because they're not, they're not dependent on that petroleum feedstock. So I looked primarily at polyethylene, a high density polyethylene commonly found in milk jugs. Um, I also looked at PVC found in household piping. Um, and then the two bio-based polymers I looked at were polyhydroxy uh, butyrate, um, which has been utilized successfully in crab trap size exclusion rings that keep small or allow small crabs to be able to escape um, crab traps. And then polylactic acid, which if you go to any function, such as over at the Civic Center, like we had yesterday, um, sorry, <laughs> uh, we had these little cups and they were made out of polylactic acid, which is formed from the fermentation of lactic acid um, harvested from sugars and corn and that sort of thing. So like I said, not all bio-based plastics are biodegradable. PHB is actually produced in situ by certain types of bacteria. Um, so you can grow bacteria, feed them, um, and then harvest the kind of the polymer bead that forms inside of that, these bacteria. And because it's formed by, by bacteria, they're actually able to consume it and degrade it. Polylactic acid, on the other hand, is not considered a biodegradable polymer. It is considered compostable in industrial um, environments, though. So the reason I was interested in bio-based plastics was because that they are growing in market share. Currently, it's only about 2% of the entire plastic market, um, but they are forecasted to reach nearly 9 million metric tons in production cap capacity by the year 2030. And so that means that with increased use of these plastics, they are going to be ending up in uh, aquatic environments. And so it's important to understand their impact. <laughs> so these bio-based polymers were the foundation of my master's project. Um, first part of my talk, or first part of my project focused on this chemical absorption um, of different types of contaminants to these bio-based polymers compared to the petrochemical-based polymers. Um, and then the second half, which I'll be talking about today, is these microbial communities. Um, so what are biofilms? Biofilms are the precursor, precursor to something known as biofouling. So the, um, the collection of oysters and barnacles and seaweed that grow on the bottom of your boat when you leave it sitting too long, that's, uh, that's biofouling. And so this image depicts, depicts, depicts <laughs> what um, happens at kind of a larger scale uh, with regards to biofouling. So this image is from a dock that washed up on the Oregon coast from the 2011 tsunami. And here you can see that there is a whole bunch of critters, seaweed, et cetera, et cetera, that have been carried across the sea from Japan all the way to the US coast. Um, and so that kind of demonstrates on a larger scale what we're concerned about when we talk about microbial colonization of microplastics. These plastics and this debris can carry organisms that are pathogenic, are um, invasive, and can generally change ecosystems. So um, I just wanted to touch really quickly on the life cycle of a biofilm, because that kind of forms the basis of what um, my project essentially focused on. Uh, initial colonization happens within this zero to 12 day range where single free floating bacteria can land on a surface and colonize it quickly. Um, the bacterial cells aggregate, attach, grow, colonize, um, and then within 17 days it forms a mature biofilm which can then disperse and release free floating members into the environment so that the cycle repeats. This also happens on your teeth. So uh, at the end of the day when you've got kind of that like gross film or maybe if you didn't brush your teeth the night before and you wake up and your mouth feels kind of gross, that's a biofilm. <laughs> um, so in 2013, Zettler et al. out of Woods Hole um, defined this term plastosphere, uh, relating specifically to this unique community of microbes that colonize marine plastic debris. Um, in their work, they went out into the North Atlantic and did a trawl for plastics floating on the surface. 
and did some investigations on this. Um, this image is actually not from the Zettler paper, but I think it's a, a better image. Um, this is a scanning electron micrograph from, in, from Oberbeckman et al. in 2016 that shows just kind of the diversity of microbes and colonizing animals um, that happen upon plastic debris out in the environment. Um, and so some sort of algal based something ciliates and diatoms, um, and then the surface of the plastic can be seen here at the bottom. Um, something that spurred my investigation was that in 2013 with the Zettler paper, they actually found an increase of pathogenic vibrio on microplastic debris floating out in the, uh, the center of the, of the ocean. So since 2013, there has been increased investigations into uh, microbial colonization on plastic debris. Um, specifically, scientists are kind of starting to look into whether or not this colonizing community is truly unique. Um, Zettler found that the colonizing community on plastics was different from the surrounding seawater, but is it different from natural floating particles in the marine environment? Uh, furthermore, <coughs> uh, there have been some studies that have come out and said that colonization might be driven more by spatiotemporal factors rather than kind of the substrate properties. Um, and so when I came along, I decided that I wanted to look more into this specifically with these bio-based polymers. So the kind of the formation of my project was that there would be differences um, based on the different plastics, so they, based on that different uh, substance, substrate type. So my objectives were to um, compare the, the microbial colonizing communities for four different types of plastics, polyethylene, PVC, that polylactic acid, PHB, and then I added a natural polymer material, chitin, that I harvested from a blue crab. Um, and as I said, I was also kind of interested in this question of increased pathogenic bacteria on plastics that had been reported previously. So, Methods um, I have here, this is what my plastics look like. This is polyethylene, PVC, PHB, and uh, PLA. These are all pre-production pellets, also known as myrtles, or if you find them on the beach, people call them mermaid's tears. Um, so these are actually the raw material that get transported to production facilities in order to form things like your water bottles and your plastic cups and all those sorts of things. Um, so I took about two grams of each of these beads um, sealed them in a fiberglass, me fiberglass mesh bag, um, suspended them from a float, and then uh, deployed them out behind my graduate school at VIMS, which is located here at the mouth of the York River, on the Chesapeake Bay um, for 7, 14, and 28 days. At the end of each of those periods, I went out, um, rinsed off the, the bags from all the kind of colonizing uh, amphipods and debris and all this kind of stuff. Rinse them off, um, store them at minus 20 degrees, and then perform DNA extraction. Um, the DNA that I amplified, the 16S RNA gene, um, was amplified using Illumina MySeq, which is a, a next generation high performance method. So um, I have to say that I kind of knew a priori going into this that I was going to find pathogenic bacteria because on the day that I deployed my plastics, here's me on my first day going out, um, it was about 100 degrees. Uh, the water was completely stagnant. Um, <laughs> VIMS has a pretty robust oyster aquaculture program. So actually in the background of this photo is a bunch of oyster cages. And um, if you know anything about oysters is that you can get Vibrio from eating oysters. So um, I found about two weeks later that I had this infection on my leg um, and the doctors suspected that it was a Vibrio infection. Um, and so if I had any advice to any young researchers in the Chesapeake Bay, to always wear waders, even if it's 100 degrees outside and the water is nice. <laughs> Um, so jumping into my results, this is, this is a principal coordinate analysis um, plot of my five substrates showing kind of the diversity in the microbial communities between the different plastics. Um, so each plastic was examined in triplicate. Um, you can see here chitin in the dark purple has clustered far away from the other 
um, substrates showing that it is kind of has greater differences in it than the other plastics. And so this is day seven, which is during this early colonization phase where these free floating, free floating bacteria are still colonizing and the back in the uh, biofilm is still establishing. Um, day 14, this period of rapid growth shows that the communities have shifted. Um, there's still a wide amount of diversity in the different plastics. Oh, I forgot to mention, um, polyethylene here is in dark blue. Um, PHB is in this kind of lighter blue. PLA is in green and PVC is in orange. Um, by day 14, chitin is still clustering farther away from the other plastics. And then by day 28, what we see is that um, the plastics have kind of all clumped together into this one area um, where there's still kind of wide variety between the different substrates, but chitin has finally decided to join the party um, once plastics, uh, once the micro, well, sorry, once the biofilms were able to mature and establish. Um, the, the different communities tend to kind of cluster together. So up here in the upper right hand corner, um, that's no moon. It's actually an image of one of my biofilmed plastics that I took um, after staining it with crystal violet. Um, so you can see kind of the interesting growth that I was getting on these polymers, even though after only 28 days of being out in the York River. Um, I knew once upon a time what that was. I don't recall any more. I'm sure it's in a paper somewhere. <laughs> um, so this next image is of the relative abundance of um, all of the orders found on my plastic substrates. And you can see that each one is pretty different than the other. There were no kind of obvious patterns that showed themselves between um, the petrochemical based plastics, the polyethylene and the PVC or in the bio based plastics. Um, and so that was a little unexpected, but still um, really cool. Additionally, I was interested in finding um, if there was an increased abundance of these pathogenic bacteria. Um, so when I went through the genera and I added it all up, there was about a 38%, 39% total abundance across all samples at all time points. Um, and Vibrio accounted for about 0.27% of that. Um, and there were three kind of variants of that Vibrio found. So where was this found? Um, it was primarily actually on chitin, about 98% of the total Vibrio found was on chitin. 73% of that was on day one, or on day seven rather. So um, as you can see from this, that there was really no elevated Vibrio presence on my microplastics. It was really all harbored on the chitin particles, um, which wasn't super surprising because chitin is kind of a known reservoir for Vibrio when it's in its um, settled state. <laughs> um, but I did make an unexpected kind of discovery while I was uh, mining through lots of data. Um, I found that we had a, a, a high abundance of this bacterium called exiguobacterium. It was found at about 19 and a half percent overall. Um, when I started digging into the literature, I found that uh, species of exobacterium were actually reported hydrocarbon degraders, chitin degraders, and even potentially plastic degraders. Uh, Yang et al. in 2015 demonstrated or showed that mealworms fed a diet of polystyrene were actually able to digest polystyrene and it was primarily due to the exobacterium found in their guts. And so that was really interesting. This exobacterium was found kind of ubiquitously. There was no um, kind of rhyme or reason here. Uh, it was found across all substrates at all time points. Though there was maybe a slight increase in exobacterium during this day seven period, indicating that it's an early colonizer um, and potentially could have degrading abilities. Um, now, it was beyond the scope of my work to actually go into whether or not it was degrading the plastic, but um, it was still kind of really cool to see. 
So to summarize, um, I found no differences in the microbial communities between our, um, our bio-based plastics and our petrochemical-based plastics. Um, and while there were differences in our natural chitin particles, um, these differences resolved as the biofilm matured. Um, there was no increased vibrio on our plastics, which I guess is good news. Um, and then I did find this interesting species, um, exobacterium, that could have potential to degrade a wide variety of plastics in estuarine environments. Um, and so, did I answer my question? Are bio-based plastics a green alternative? Um, the answer is a little fuzzy. So um, from the first half of my thesis, which I didn't present today, I actually found that bio-based plastics have a less propensity to absorb hydrophobic organic contaminants from the environment. Um, and so that means that maybe if we use these plastics more and they do end up in the environment and they do get break down, they're not gonna absorb as much chemicals from the environment as their petrochemical based cousins. Um, and so that has implications for food chain effects, et cetera. Um, I found no increased potential for harboring pathogenic bacteria. And furthermore, and PHB is known to degrade in the marine environment in about a year. Um, these crab traps that I was speaking about at the beginning of my talk, um, the Center for Coastal Resources, CCRM, <laughs> Center for, mm, I can't remember what it stands for right now. <laughs> um, but they actually patented and used these PHB crab trap size exclusion rings, um, and they hand them out to watermen so that in the event that their crab traps are lost, um, it cuts down on the amount of derelict ghost fishing that happens in the environment. So that's a good news. PLA, on the other hand, um, is only compostable in industrial facilities. It does not readily degrade in the marine environment. Um, so that's kind of a wash there. It was still interesting to investigate though. Um, so with that, I'd like to acknowledge my advisor, Rob Hale, Virginia Institute of Marine Science, um, BK Song for kind of walking me through the microbial aspects of my thesis. Um, as Casey said, I got my degree in chemistry, and I like to say I'm hashtag not a biologist. <laughs> um, and the kind of slew of people that got me through my thesis and my graduate work. So with that, I will take any questions. Um, so why is chitin a reservoir for Vibrio? Uh, the question was whether or why chitin is a reservoir for Vibrio. Um, I will say that I do not know. <laughs> uh, I'm going, I think that Vibrio is kind of a generalist when it comes to colonizing particles in the marine environment and chitin just happens to be one of the most prominent particles in the water column. Um, but I don't know if there's anything specific about why it sticks to chitin. I have a paper though, and I could send it to you if you're interested. <laughs> I have another question. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, so it feels like you could almost use the fact that plastic harbors large microbial communities and uh, sequesters like toxins from the environment as like a reason to not use these bioplastics. Like, is that an argument at all? Yeah, um, so that's really interesting. And kind of when I started out at VIMS, I wanted to link these two chapters together and actually investigate how the biofilm impacts absorption of chemicals from the environment and how it impacts leaching of chemicals from the plastics. Um, turned out to be a lot more complicated than I could reasonably accomplish, especially with no funding. Um, and so I wasn't able to make that linkage, but yeah, no, there's, um, there's been some interest in actually using plastics to remediate certain types of water um, because it's able to absorb these chemicals. I don't know if it's a reason to continue because then we don't really know what the downstream effects are, but yeah, no, there has been arguments for that. <laughs> And that even if a fish ate a piece of plastic, it would potentially clean that fish of absorbed contaminants. But that's beyond my uh, it's beyond my pay grade. <laughs> Anything else? 
Well, thank you. Feel free to find me. My email address is um, kelly.ulig at NOAA. So reach out. Okay. Are there any questions online? Uh, no online questions. Okay. So we'll just uh, <laughs> take a short break and we'll be back at 1230. So thank you, Kelly. Thank you.